So in the previous video, we were doing the forward reverse contactor, uh, but we did the open loop in that we were just looking at the output of the actual bit in the PLC and using that as our holding contact, provide another path of logic to keep our reverse coil on. The problem was that we didn't see anything out in the field. We couldn't see whether the contactor had actually pulled in, and we also didn't have anything on the overload. The overload was over here, and the normally closed contact could kick out our forward reverse coils, uh, but we didn't have a signal to tell us in the PLC program that an overload had occurred. So we need a number of different uh, inputs here, guys, in order to create that closed loop. So the first thing we need is a holding contact on the forward coil. So I'm going to make use of the normally open contact on my forward coil. Then I'm going to make use of the normally open contact on my reverse. And then because I've used the normally closed contact on the overload, I'm going to use the normally open contact on the overload as well. Okay, each of those guys is going to go into uh, my inputs here. So for my forward coil, the holding contact is uh, input number five. My reverse is input number six. And my overload is input number seven. Beautiful. Okay, obviously I've got three and four here, but I'm not showing them in the diagram. Um, I've also got uh, other common connections. So my common connections have to be joined together so that I have a path back. On the previous video, I had changed the, uh, the color there to blue for my wiring, uh, but I forgot to jumper my common back to uh, the zero volts. So again, if I had a, a common here, that fed each of these guys, or it was a return for these guys, I need to put a jumper from this common over to here. And that's a, one of the things that will screw up your uh, your program, in that if you don't provide a path back to the negative of your power source, then the signal will be coming into these input terminals, but because this isn't joined to the common, it doesn't actually see that voltage on the PLC. So just make sure that you've joined up all your commons there. Okay, now we need to bring, I've sourced each of these guys. Sourcing meaning that I've just provided a positive voltage to each of these bad boys. Positive voltage coming from this terminal right here on my PLC. Again, the PLC uh, may have like a, a 120 volt source. And when you put that 120 into the PLC, it has a rectifier circuit that provides you with 24 volts DC that you can use for your inputs. In this case, I'm doing a sourcing and that the positive is going to each of my switches and I'm switching the positive. The PLC already has a reference to the negative here. So let's draw each of these guys into our inputs. And then each of these individual contacts are going to go to their own separate inputs. So we're ripping out all of the components out of our ladder diagram here and putting individual inputs and individual outputs and the only thing that will determine how these guys affect our outputs will be the PLC. All right, so then we got to do our addressing there. So the addressing for uh, the forward input is going to be on the Tweedo suite is going to be percent input zero. And I've physically wired it to number five. So I'm going to put it into number five. There we go. Uh, this guy I have wired to my input terminal number six. And this guy right here, I'm going to get percent input 0 0.7. Excellent. Okay, and that's everything that I need in order to create a closed loop control on my program now. These contacts right here, let me show you where they are on the actual contact or on the overload relay. Okay, so I'm using the, the Schneider or Telemechanique IEC contactors. Uh, and the normally open contact that I just used as the holding contact is this terminal right here. So I have a wire, my positive wire going to one side of that contact. And then the other side of that contact, this normally open, is going to my input. Okay. Within there, obviously, there is a normally open contact that when the contactor changes state, it will close and send a signal into the PLC. 
Okay, over here on my reverse, I've got again the normally open here. Coming from there, I'm going to a separate input on the PLC. So I'm actually looking at the the state of that contactor. I need to see that that relay has actually, or the contactor has actually pulled in. When it pulls in, then that contact will actually close, and then I'll send a signal into the PLC. So I'm no longer relying on a bit of information in the software. I'm relying on something out in the field to say that the coil, so the coil is right here. Come on. Windows not working with me. There we go. So my coil is right there. Once it gets juiced up, then it will pull in and will stay the change the state of that contact there. Okay, so on the overload, I have made use of this normally closed contact right here. So in doing so, I have that guy uh, in line with each of my outputs. So let me just redraw. I've got my forward output, then I've got my reverse output, and both of those are sharing a common normally closed overload contact. So that if this contact opens, then neither of these contactors, being these coils right here, will get current, and that will turn off the motor. But I also need to send a signal, so that contact is right there, right? So I've made use of that contact, and that contact is on my AC side here. But I also need to send a signal into the PLC. So I've, on the IAC, I also have a normally open contact here. So I'm going to make use of that, and again, I'm going to put positive to one terminal there. And then from the other terminal, I'm going to go to an input on the PLC. So this overload will do two things for me. Uh, it will, this isn't drawing all that well, let me just show you where these connections are, right? So this contact right here would be right there, and then this contact right there would be right there. So that if it, if it opens, it's going to take out the AC portion of, of my uh, outputs. But in addition to that, it's also going to send a signal into the PLC. All right, so hopefully that's clear. Let's go back to the program. We'll change our addressing and drop in those different inputs that we decided on. So what do we need to do? We need to uh, change this from the Q, from this output bit, to an actual input. So we're no longer looking at uh, the forward coil. We're actually looking at an input from this contact on the forward contactor. So we had uh, percent input 0 0.5. Okay, and we said that that was our forward forwarding contact. Okay, we're also going to do the same over here. Rather than relying on a piece of software to tell us that it's on, we're going to look out in the field and my reverse holding contact is physically wired to input, so percent input 0 0.6. Very nice. Okay. In addition to that, I'm still looking at this bit of information here for the reverse coil, but I can actually look at this contact and have the opposite instruction so that when the reverse coil is off, then this looks for the presence of no voltage. Obviously, if the reverse coil is off, there's no voltage being impressed on that input terminal. So I can also address this as percent input 0 0.6 and then I'm no longer relying on that bit of information I'm now looking out in the field and just using the opposite instruction that takes a little while to get your head around in it we're using the same input here a normally open contact but we're using different instructions at different points in the actual program okay so we will relabel this as our reverse holding contact And we're going to do the same thing over here. We're going to make this as our forward holding contact. Rather than looking at that Q bit, that output bit there, we're actually going to look at the input, and the input for the forward holding contact is input 0 0.5. 
Beautiful. So now we've actually got uh, some signals coming into the PLC to tell us that the contactor has actually turned on and has gotten power and is working. The other thing we need to do is throw in our overloads as well. So our overload is going to percent input 0 0.7 and I'm going to place the overload uh, right here and right here. Now if the overload is still perfectly fine and hasn't been tripped, then this contact will be in its rest state. In its rest state, meaning that there has not been an overload, then the 24 volts is going to come over here and stop at that contact. So there will be no voltage impressed on that input number 7. So I'm going to use an instruction that looks for no voltage, and the instruction that looks for no voltage is an examine if open. So I'm going to do identical instructions on either one. And for each of these guys, that is our overload contact. Okay, I haven't left myself too much room, so I'm going to put that right here and right here. And I'm going to put the address just below. So the address for that overload contact is percent input 0 0.7. And down here, remember that I can use my inputs as many times as I want. So I can monitor that this has not closed or that the overload has not tripped uh, in a number of different places. But we can see here that I have the wrong instruction. So let me just change that. So we'll change that to an examine if open. Okay, and now we can walk through. We need uh, that stop button, push button to be remaining in its closed state, which means that there will be voltage there. We need someone to actually press this forward push button, which means that uh, we will monitor when that voltage goes into the input. We want to see that the reverse holding contact is still open. So we're going to use an examine of open. And for the overload contact, we're going to examine that this contact is still open as well. So we're going to use an examine if open as well. If all these are true, we'll turn on our forward coil. And to monitor that the forward coil has actually pulled in, then this contact will close, and we're using an examine if closed, or examine if one, or examine if there's voltage to this terminal to provide us with that closed loop to keep us with the forward coil energized when we release that forward push button. All right, so the one thing, the two things that will screw up is that I am using one input here as a normally open contact, but I'm using separate instructions within the actual program. And again, over here in the overload, we're usually used to seeing the normally closed being used. It's already been used over here on the AC side. I'm going to use the opposite contact there, the normally open. And I'm going to just look to see that it's still open and that the overload has not tripped. All right, guys, let's drop it into our Tweedo suite. All right, guys, first thing I want you to see here is uh, I'm going to press the my stop push button. And as I press the stop push button, you can see that it um, is no longer true. So you can see me pressing the stop button real time. I'm going to now hit the forward push button. When I hit the forward push button, that's going to energize my coil. And so we're going to energize this coil and you'll find that the contact there closes. And when that closes, then, <clears throat> excuse me, this holding contact will pull in. So I'll now hit the forward push button and that will go true. Excellent. Okay, I'm now going to let go of the forward push button. And now that this holding contact has pulled in, then this is now true. And we had this alternate path of logic that going to the contactor. I'll now hit the stop, which will break that continuity of logic. Not the continuity of current, but the continuity of logic. I'm looking for the presence of voltage. When I press that stop button, I will open that contact and I will stop the voltage going to that terminal. And you can see there that that now drops out my contactor. I let go of my stop push button and now I'm ready to go in either forward or reverse depending on which push button I press. If I'm in forward and I trip the overload on the previous open loop then uh, the contactor was still try trying to be energized by the PLC which was an issue. So let's see if that is still the case. So I'm going to open this guy up and I'm going to trip the, the overload here. So I'm just going to push this to the side here. Beautiful. 
you can see that the contactor just kicked out there and it kicked out for two reasons one because the overload has tripped the overload contact has now closed so this contact is now closed uh, and it's sending voltage into the PLC which makes this untrue and the holding contact is kicked out so we have redundancy here to stop that contactor from turning on. Now I'm going to reset the overload so by pressing this you'll be able to see that this becomes true but in the previous open loop the contactor energized right away. Uh, nice so it hasn't energized wouldn't that suck if you just reset the overload and all of a sudden the contactor turned on. What we want to do is we want to go back to the forward reverse station, press the forward, and then be able to energize that contactor. Right on. So that's what the, the closed loop provides us with. We're getting a closed loop signal from the actual contact here, which is coming in right here. And we're seeing that when the overload trips, so again, when I trip this out, you'll see that the overload contact has told us that we're in an overload. We could then have a light turn on to indicate that we're in an overload position. Okay, so let's reset that overload and let's check out the reverse contactor circuit. So you can see here again that if I hit the stop push button, it changes in both the rungs there. When I'm hitting this reverse push button, I'm going to energize this contactor, which will close this contact. And then that'll provide us with an alternate path of logic to keep this guy turned on. So watch this reverse push button as I press it. There we go. I'm now going to let go of the reverse push button and the holding contact here has pulled in and that's providing a signal to the PLC to allow that contactor to stay on. Excellent. If I hit the stop, obviously it drops it out. You can see that these two are referencing either contactor. So the forward contactor here, we're seeing that it's off. Here we're seeing that the reverse contactor is off. And so when I put this into the reverse, so again, in reverse, you'll see that uh, this contact is no longer true. There we go. Okay, so I can't hit the forward and turn on the forward contactor. Beautiful. So everything's working properly. We had that added advantage of having a signal coming in from the outside world into the PLC. And finally, now we'll hit this overload. And so I'll trip the overload again, and it should kick out the contactor and the holding contact. There we go. So we see that the overload has now tripped and the holding contact has dropped out and the contactor is de-energized. I will reset the overload here. Now we can see that this just came in and again it's just waiting for us to hit either the forward or the reverse push button in order to go in forward or reverse direction. Beautiful. All right, guys, that covers the closed loop now. So <clears throat> keep going with the playlist. Uh, I think the next thing that we should cover would be, uh, would be timers. So keep going on the playlist, and thanks for your patience. Any comments uh, or criticisms, leave them below. Thanks very much. See you guys.